Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another chapter as we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and uh, what a great journey it is and uh, there's nothing that we'd rather do than just spend time in God's word. And uh, as we are going, uh, we are learning many things and the Holy Spirit is uh, revealing many things to us and He's changing us uh, day by day. And uh, what a great um, privilege is to be to, to be the work of God's hands, you know, that He can come and He can shape us and mold us as, we, as the word is going inside us. As the word is going inside us and there is some things taking shape in our life. And uh, what a beautiful thing that um, is just you, when you look back and see uh, how God has brought us here and what, I mean, the truth that's been revealed through his word and, and understanding of the truth uh, just changes us and changes our mindset, our thinking, our lifestyle, everything is just beautiful, you know, how God's word uh, works in our life. And uh, so we are uh, really excited that uh, we are here uh, today. Um, John chapter 18, uh, it's one, <coughs> one of the chapters, you know, that uh, uh, seems like very unfair. The world is so unfair. The world's ways are crooked. The people are very corrupt. People are out to betray, backstab. So this is a picture of the world. John chapter 18 is a picture of the world. And how people are in this world, how the systems are, how the judgments, you know, like the court system and everything. It's a picture of the world. And in this, Jesus boldly stands and he says something. And I want you to understand that. So we are in this world, but not of this world. Jesus, yesterday we saw in yesterday's prayer, he said in John chapter 17, Lord, I, I, I pray that you don't take them out of this world, but you protect them from the evil one while they are in this world. So dear brothers and sisters, yes, the world is unfair. It's corrupt. The systems are broken. People can betray, people can suffer alone, but Jesus says, I have overcome the world. He says, be courageous, be courageous, I have overcome the world. So we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So that means we are living in this world, but we don't follow the ways of the world. And that is God's ways. We will follow, okay, and we will see this beautiful thing. So I will quickly go through the ways of the world. And then we will see the answer of a Christian, the answer of Jesus Christ to the world's ways. The answer of Jesus. And when we take that answer of Jesus, when we understand the answer of Jesus from John chapter 18, it will change our lives. It will change our lives. One of these verse in this chapter really changed my life, literally changed my life in the year 2017. Literally changed my life. And I'll tell you, so God's word, I mean like all the words of God are life changing. But especially in my life, my testimony is that there was one thing here that God really spoke to my heart. And uh, I want to share it with you. I'm, I'm, I'm um, humbled, you know, by being able to share this word. John chapter 18. Here now Jesus Christ has prayed this beautiful prayer. If you have not watched it, please go and watch John chapter 17. You know, he prayed this beautiful prayer and just like, you know, it gives us so much information for us to pray when we reach out to our father because Jesus is our brother and when he's our brother you know because we have the same heavenly father heavenly father father of Jesus was the heavenly father and our father is the heavenly father and so when we have the same father and we got an example the forerunner from Jesus Christ and we keep that prayer okay so now uh, chapter 18 Jesus is going into this garden he says you know he goes to this garden in the across the Kidron valley and he has disciples go there. So I've covered this in detail in Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14 and Luke 22. What happened in the garden of Gethsemane? So, so I have covered this in detail there. So you can either watch Matthew 26, Mark 14 or Luke 22 and you can get an idea there. So today, so what we go through when we go through the Bible, we will stick to what is in that, in that, in that passage. Because we have to go through the Bible. That's subjective. It's called Bible journey. It is not uh, my own journey or my own thing. It is like we have to stick to the script of God's word. So we will, uh, if you want to know more about the Gethsemane experience, you can go to those chapters that I mentioned. So the Kidron Valley is like a valley that, that flows and there's water. During the Passover time, the Josephus, the historian wrote that around like 2,50,000 sheep were killed. 2,50,000 sheep were killed for the Passover so that the sins of the people can be atoned for. And so as, as, as Jesus is walking there, I'm sure there's blood that's flowing into this Kidron Valley, this stream, this river, small river, like you know, even there, I think it's there today probably. So it's like that valley that blood is flowing. 
So that because there used to be around 15 to 20 lakh people that used to come from all over the parts of the world and from the Israel to come and celebrate Passover. Very important time. So that time Jesus was Christ was our Passover lamb. He became our Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of the world who takes away the sins of the world. Behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So that is Jesus Christ. So we see this picture of blood flowing in that Kidron Valley because of the sheep that they have been cutting. Almost like 2 lakh sheep, 2 and a half lakh sheep, he says. And so you can imagine. Um, in, in, in verse 1 to 9, we'll see first, you know, verses 1 to 9, he's, he's coming and then Judas is coming with Aram, almost like they say, heavily armored people. Like, you know, like uh, he, uh, the, the Judas took a company of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees and came with lanterns, torches and weapons. So they came armored like with weapons and all. So some people, they say it's a company means like around 650 people. Like 650 people to catch Jesus Christ. 650 people. And at that time, Jesus asked, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with him. And when Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Just imagine that scene. That Jesus Christ said, I am he. And then all, they all fall. Because, you know, that Jesus Christ, you know, they say that uh, he's, he's so... Uh, powerful and they're probably taken back and I don't know why how they fall whether everybody fell and all we don't know but they fell and Jesus Christ said I told you I am he so if you're looking for me let these men go you see what Jesus is saying hey you want me you take me don't touch my disciples don't touch them and this was to fulfill the words he had said in the previous day that prayer you know Jesus mentioned in John uh, 17 verse uh, 12 I believe Jesus said that you know I, I protected them by your name that not one was lost except the son of destruction that means except Judas carrier so here Jesus is saying the same word is fulfilled today the prayer that he prayed is fulfilled here when he said I have not lost one of them you have given me that means Jesus Christ did not allow even one disciple to be you know caught or you know put into arrest so that is the thing we have that Jesus Christ you know yesterday's prayer also we saw that he is Praying for protection, that he says, Father, I'm going to come to you and you protect them from the evil one in this world. So it's a very cruel world, but God's protection is there. God is protecting us. You know, he's, he's leading us. It says in John chapter 10, he says in verse 28, they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You are in God's hands and nobody can snatch you out of God's hand. Remember that day, brother and sister. And then in John chapter 6, verse 37, he says, The one who comes to me, I will ne certainly not cast out. I will not say, get out. Jesus will never say, get out to anybody who comes to him. And in here, in John chapter 6, verse 39, he says, He has given me, uh, all that he has given me, I lose nothing. I will not lose even one person. So if you are a child of God, you are his child. And Jesus is leading you and guiding you. Okay, so that is this beautiful thing. And so, there are many things I wanted to share here, but you know, we don't have time because you know, this is something that, uh, that you have to look at com in combination with Matthew chapter 26, Mark chapter 14 and Luke chapter 22. And then <clears throat> verses 10 to 11, verses 10 to 11, here says, The Simon Peter who had a sword drew it, struck the high priest's servants and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup that the father has given me? He says, put it away. And then Jesus in Luke, I think he says, no more of this. He says, no more of this sword business. No using the sword. Don't use the sword to attack people or to, you know, uh, put people. He said, like, put it in your sheath. That means like take the sword and put it back where it was. And Jesus goes, we see, in not in, it's not mentioned here in this gospel, but it's mentioned in um, Luke and all where like Jesus goes and heals the, that man's uh, ears. He, he places it and he heals it. And so what do we see this year? We see that Jesus Christ, you know, was in full control. Many times we try to help God. We're like, Lord, Lord, if I do this, I think your will be done. I'll, I'll be helping you here. No, God doesn't need our help. Peter didn't need to help God. God didn't need Peter's help. Peter's sword could not accomplish anything. Human anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God, it says. Human anger does not accomplish the righteousness of God. So, so just being like humanly trying to do some things will not accomplish God's purpose in our life. And so we see here that Peter had to put his sword down. Jesus is healing. And even today, dear brothers and sisters, the church and you and I are called to heal, not to hurt people. 
Many times, you know, with our words, you know, with our, with our actions, we hurt people. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 I've come to heal people. And we are called to heal people, not to hurt people. And Christian life is an, is an example where God is working through you. His glory is manifested in you. And we are called to heal people. We are called to talk gracious words. Not foul words, not harsh words, not, not criticizing words, but encouraging words. And this, that's what Jesus is asking us today. And, and I pray that we will understand the purpose of God. Jesus is in full control. He doesn't need Peter's help to be set free. Peter doesn't, Peter can't set Jesus free. Jesus said like, you know, if, 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 if you, if I, if I call my father, 72,000 angels will come. He said 12 legions of angels, you know, will come and will, will protect me. So why, why, why we are trying to fight? God can do, he is very, he can defend himself. And that's the thing. And we have to understand that in our life that, that there is this, power of darkness that, that Jesus recognized. He says, he understood this was the dominion of darkness. We see this in Luke in the same passage. He understood that the darkness was coming through and the dominion of darkness was taking. So there will be spiritual attacks. There will be spiritual attacks. But Jesus willingly submitted to the arrest. He did not resist. He did not say, no, 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 I will fight back. He says, okay, if God's plan has to be accomplished and I have to be arrested, I have to be beaten, I have to be put to cross, here, arrest me. Take me. It's okay, I will not fight back. I will not fight back, arrest me. That's what Jesus did. Dear brothers and sisters, there will be spiritual problems here and there in our life. Let God's will be done. You just give it to God. You just pray about it. Just walk in peace, walk in calmness, walk with joy. I'm telling you, God's going to do great things. We are called to give grace to people, not to hurt people, cause guilt in people, condemn people, fight back, because fight, God is fighting for us. You don't try to fight for God. You know, God is fighting for us. He will never leave us. Nobody can snatch us from his hands. Without God's permission, not even one hair will fall from our head. May God lead us and guide us in that path. Jesus here, we see this, willingly submitted to be arrested. Willingly submitted to be arrested. And then we'll see in verses 12 to 14 and 19 to 23, Jesus is before Annas and Caiaphas. Who are Annas and Caiaphas? They are the religious leaders. The religious leader, the chief priests. Annas was the father-in-law. Caiaphas was the son-in-law. Annas was very corrupt. And all the temple money, the selling and, selling and buying, he had a commission. Caiaphas had a commission. Annas had five children, five sons and Caiaphas was his son-in-law. So all these things, you know, they were made these arrangements. And Jesus got so angry. You, you remember, he comes and chases the doves and like, you know, he, he breaks and he, he throws away the money changers. They used to, what cost, like, you know, like five rupees, probably, you know, they will charge three times more so they can get commission. They are doing business in God's house. The Bible says in the last days, people will make merchandise of you. That means, you know, they will make products out of you. They will make people force and give money so that they can live off those money that people are giving. Very sad. It happened in Jesus' days, happening even today. So Jesus is saying here that Annas, you know, he goes and, you know, he is, Arrested. Verse 12, you know, it's one of the sad verses, you know, verse 12. Then the company of soldiers, the commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus Christ and tied him up. They tied him up. They bound him with ropes. They tied him with ropes. Son of man, the savior of the world, tied in ropes. He was bound by ropes. But what was in his heart? He's bound for his love for you and for me. Why it was Jesus tied? What did the ropes that tied Jesus Christ? It is ropes of love. The ropes of love. You might think like, you know, it's the soldiers arresting and like taking Jesus Christ. Oh, how sad and all. But how beautiful is the picture of that rope. It tied. It was tied around the hands of Jesus Christ because he was bound by love. He willingly got arrested. He willingly submitted his life. He willingly became a lamb that was sacrificed. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Dear brothers and sisters, God willingly paid the price for you and for me. He didn't do it grudgingly. He did it willingly. For the joy that was set before him, he went through to the cross. The joy that was set before him. What is that joy? The joy of you and me coming to know God. The joy of me, you and me coming, being delivered, made, made righteous. That is the joy of Jesus. 
my dear brothers and sisters, if you accepted Jesus Christ, if you have not accepted Jesus Christ, accept him today. Believe in him today. Trust in him today. And he's going to do something great. Jesus is bound not by the ropes of the Jewish officials, not by the ropes of this Roman soldiers, but by the ropes of love. Dear brothers and sisters, that is how much God loves you and me. And he goes and people are slapping him and people are demanding proof. They are questioning him. And um, it's like, you know, Caiaphas also said, like, you know, he, he unknowingly said, like, it's better for one man to die for the whole people. And that's what is true, right? Jesus Christ is going to die for the whole people, whole nation of Israel and for the whole world. And so we see here. And then also let's jump, you know, skip and verse come to 19 to 23. They are saying, um, they are questioning Jesus Christ putting unfair criticism on him and you know, like all these things. I have spoken openly saying like, you know, I've taught everything openly. Why do you question me? Question those who have heard my message. He's like, no, go and talk to the people who heard my message. Why are you questioning me? Jesus says. And suddenly one guy, you know, he slaps Jesus Christ. He slaps him. Verse 22. Official standing by slapped Jesus saying, is this the way you answer the high priest? You know what Jesus said? If I have answered wrongly, give evidence about the wrong. But if I rightly, why do you hit me? Jesus is saying, why are you hitting me? I mean, Jesus didn't fight back, but Jesus asking, why are you hitting me? So many times, you know, Christians come and ask me, brother, that person is treating me so unfairly. They are being so rude to me and all. I say, you can go politely and ask them, brother, what you're doing is not fair, brother. I feel hurt. We can say that. It's like, you know, you don't have to just sit there and, you know, just be quiet about it. We can go back and ask people, brother, I feel like I, I've not done anything wrong. Why are you talking about me. Why are you criticizing me, brother? You can say that. In politeness, we can say that. We can speak the truth in love. And maybe there will be a, uh, there will be some misunderstanding. It probably will get cleared. And Jesus here also is doing the same. What a great, I mean, like picture of like humility here. Like, you know, like God allowed him to be tied and to be beaten and to be slapped and to be spit upon, to be, have his beard pulled and all these things so that, so that he, so that he can do it for you and me, his love for you and me. And, and, and he has to go through this. That's humility, dear brothers and sisters. This is humility in action. Chapter 18, you know, like, like all these oppressions of the worldly people against believers, against, against children of God. And how do we react? And this is humility, the picture of humility. In chapter 18, when every time I read, you know, I, I see this humble man. Jesus was obedient till the cross, it says. And what a great picture of humility. And I pray that God will lead us down that path. And let's come back, you know, to verses 15 to 18 and 25 to 27. Again, a small portion. I just want to talk about uh, Simon Peter's denying Jesus Christ. Again, it's covered in Matthew chapter 26, Mark 14 and Luke 22. You can watch, you can watch those videos and you can get an understanding, especially walk, Luke, watch Luke 22, where, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, how he, how he wants Peter saying, hey, Satan wants to swift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. So that means Satan wants to attack faith of Peter. Even today, Satan's job is, you know, he's like a prowl, like, you know, like he's like a roaring lion, you know, waiting to pounce on people. So Jesus says, I mean, God says in, in, in James, like, you know, stand firm in your faith. Sorry, in, 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 uh, in Peter. You know, stand firm in your faith. He's like a roaring lion. Who to pounce upon? So stand firm in your faith. So that's the thing, dear brothers and sisters. We have to understand that in our life, there will be spiritual attacks, there will be worldly attacks, there will be attacks always. But we are not of this world. We are, we are different people, we are a different breed altogether. Because who lives in us? Jesus lives in us. He is in us. He is the Holy Spirit is working in us. I am telling you, this is the greatest privilege. And here, Peter, is this attack of faith, suddenly he gets so fearful. He gets filled of fear and he starts to tell people that he doesn't know Jesus. You know, he says like, Hey, I am not, you know, verse 17, there's a servant girl. Few hours back, he said, Lord, I will die for you. I will go to prison for you. I will do, lay my life for you. I will do anything for you. And here he's saying to this prison girl, I mean, to the servant girl, he says, I don't know him. And another guy asks him and Peter denies again. In verse 25, verse 26, again, 27, verse 26, again, he denies Jesus Christ. Denies Jesus three times. Why? Because of the fear. Fear when he saw Jesus Christ being beaten and doing all, people coming to arrest and so many soldiers and all these things. Fear came and then faith kind of gone. Faith is gone when fear comes up. 
When fear is increasing, faith goes up. When faith is high, fear goes nowhere. So that is the thing. And Jesus here very clearly, he's already warned Peter that, hey, you will deny me. And when the roaster is crowing, you know, he goes and weeps and he weeps bitterly. And we see godly repentance. What is godly repentance? Judas Cariot, filled with guilt, hung himself. Peter, filled with guilt, wept and repented. That's the difference between Judas Cariot and Peter. What a beautiful thing. And then how we see, even we are going to see in John chapter 21, how Jesus restores Peter. How he encourages Peter. How he loves Peter. So, dear brothers and sisters, are you, are you, are you fallen into certain type of sins? Have you given in to temptations and, and it's fallen? I'm telling you, don't sit there in guilt. God will not remember your sins anymore, it says in Hebrews. God will not remember. That means he won't remember. Even if you remember, God will not remember. I have wiped you as white as snow. I washed you. And that's the God we serve. Dear brothers and sisters, that we might have weakness of faith. That might be moments of weakness of faith, just like Peter here. But God is a God who restores. He's a God of grace. He will bring you back. He will bring you back. If you are in that certain situation today, I pray that you look at Peter. You read about Peter and how God restores. Especially watch Luke chapter 22, the Bible journey chapter 22 there. And you will see how God restores Peter beautifully. Okay. And now to the most important part of this chapter, verses 28 to 38. 28 to 38 and we were spend a little more time here okay and so they bring them to Pilate. Pilate is the Roman the, the political leader who are the chief priests Annas and Caiaphas they are the religious leaders they are head of the Pharisees and all those you know uh, I mean not Pharisees is a separate sect but like they're all that group the religious leaders religious police but the, they don't have power to put people to death if they have to put people to death they have to bring him to Pilate you know who's appointed by the Roman Emperor and he is the leader of the Judea area. So they brought him to the governor's headquarters, which is Pilate's office headquarters. They would not go inside. So they were shouting from outside because it was Passover. They didn't go into a Gentile's place. So they, uh, so they came, he came out and he looked at Jesus Christ. You know, it's like, uh, he says, are you, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus, you know, Pilate asks Jesus in verse 33, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you asking this on your own or you, others have told you about it? Like, so basically these people were trying to plan, scheme and go behind Jesus' back and trying to you know, tell all these things to Pilate. And Pilate says, I am not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied, your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus, beautiful reply. This is the life-changing verse that I was talking about earlier. My kingdom is not of this world. Verse 36. He said, Jesus, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I am a king, Jesus said. I was born for this and I have come into this world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth, said Pilate. So what is this? Verse, talk about. We are going to spend some time here. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And here, we see here in John chapter 17 also, that Jesus said, you know, John chapter 17, verse 15, keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Just like Jesus Christ is not of this world, you and me are not of this world. We have a different way. World's way, God's way. We are walking in God's ways. We are not walking in the world's ways. So, how the world's ways? If Jesus had come to be a king at that time, his servants would what? He would have trained an army. He would have gone like every day, wake up early in the morning, okay, let's train. Okay, take up your sticks, take up your armor, you know, let's wear it and you know, uh, I'll give you like 100 uh, running for like 2-3 miles and then come, let's do some exercises. And all those things Jesus would have done. And Jesus says this, no, no, my servants would fight. You know, if I was a king of this world, you know, if, I, if, I, if, 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 if my kingdom of, is of this world, people will, my people will fight. They wouldn't even allowed arresting the 650 people came, you know, in the garden. And at the garden of Gethsemane, they would not have arrested Jesus Christ because his servants would have fought. Even though Peter tried, you know, unfortunately. But that's the thing. So do you see Christians 
that there is a clear difference between kingdom of the world and kingdom of God. I pray that the sooner you see this, the difference between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of, the, uh, kingdom of God, the ways of the world and the ways of God, when you understand this, I think our life will change. We will not be fighting. We will not be fighting against people. You know, the Bible says that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people. There's, it's not a husband and wife problem. It is a spiritual problem. You know, I want you to uh, turn to those two uh, passages in, in, and read that. You know, you will understand what's the world uh, kingdom and uh, kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 onwards. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 onwards. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up in the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So you see here, our, our, our battle is not against people, flesh and blood. People are not our enemies. In fact, we are to love our enemies. Who are our enemies? The Powerful strongholds, we demolish arguments, the wrong thoughts and the, and the stuff that comes and arguments that against God, the, the, the guilt and the, and the depression and the, all the things that comes against God, that is our enemy. And Ephesians chapter 6 also, for our struggle is verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. So this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist him in the evil day. And be prepared everything to take your stand. So dear brothers and sisters, that you are prepared to take your stand. And you have to understand that, that the, this world is not our home. The, we have been chosen out of the world. In John chapter 15 verse 19 it says, we have been chosen out of the world. The kingdom of the world is outward. Outward things only. Like the glory of the world is outward. But the kingdom of God is inward. The kingdom of God is in you, within you. In the midst of you, Jesus says. And the kingdom of God in the midst of us, it changes us from inside out. And Jesus says, I came for only this purpose, to testify to the truth. And what is the truth? The truth that, that there is kingdom of God. Repent for the kingdom of God is near, Jesus said. That's the truth he came to proclaim. And he lived this in kingdom of God life. And the world will hate us. John chapter 15 verse 19, it says, Jesus has chosen us out of the world and the world will hate us. And Jesus, in John chapter 17, verse 14 and 15 says, You are not of this world. We are, we, are, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. And James chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, it says, Don't be friends of this world. Don't be friendly with this worldly lifestyle. Don't be friendly. That's the truth. The more you are focused on God's ways, you know, the world gets less and less interesting for us. The world becomes less and less attractive for us. Because the ways of God are glorious and beautiful. And they are amazing. And then, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Don't love the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For what are the love of the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of one's possessions. Those are the worldly things. The pride that comes with oh, having a lot of stuff. The lust of the eyes, you know, looking at stuff and like coveting other people's things and other people. And lust of the flesh, you know, the fleshly appraising that comes in our body. The fleshly things, you know, irritations and lusts and all these things. These are not of God. And uh, dear brothers and sisters, I pray that you would understand that Jesus Christ here is standing and testifying before Pilate. He's saying, no, I am not of this world. My dear brothers and sisters, can we say that in our heart today? I am not of this world. My world is not this home. I mean, my home is not this world. I am a traveler. I am a pilgrim. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I am a walking pilgrim with Jesus Christ. I am on a pilgrim, pilgrimage and I am heading to my home. And that's the most important thing, dear brothers and sisters. I pray that this truth will change us. The moment this truth became internalized in me, my goals, my ambitions, my lifestyle, everything changed. Till then I was like wanting to become great in the eyes of people and gloried in the eyes of people. Not anymore. I said, Lord, I am not of this world anyway. <laughs> I am not, Lord, I am not made for this world. I am made for you, Lord. And help me to walk in your paths. Help me in the way to, way to walk in your ways. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that uh, you have set an example. Thank you for putting your Holy Spirit in me so that I can have strength and energy to face this unfair world. 
Thank you, Lord, that you are telling us to be courageous because you have conquered the world. John chapter 16. That I have conquered the world. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you have overcome the world. That we go before you. I mean, we go behind you, Lord. That you go before us. Shall we pray, dear brothers and sisters? Are you being pressurized by the world? Are you being stressed out by the world? The, 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 the hurry-burry, like doing this and that, I want to do this, I want to do this, accomplish this and all. I'm telling you, rest in Jesus Christ. Come to him. He's going to do it. It's going to be beautiful. He's going to do it, dear brothers and sisters. And you will see what a great miracle it is. So we saw this in this chapter, how the world can betray, how the world can attack, accuse, beat, spit, all these things. But Jesus answered us, I am not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. Even my servants, for them also, their kingdom also is not of this world. Who are you and me? We are servants. And who, what's our kingdom? Our kingdom is the kingdom of God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you have revealed your purpose for us. You have revealed your plans for us, Lord. We are not of this world. We are not made for this world, Lord. In fact, we struggle and struggle, Lord, many times. Heavenly Father, Lord, you strengthen, Lord, the weak knees of our children, Lord. Strengthen the weak hands, Lord, of your children. Help them, Lord, to walk. Help them to walk in the kingdom of God's ways. Thank you, Father, that you're going to do it. Thank you for speaking to us. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen.